Dear Lord, we do want to thank you that we can be here. We do not fear persecution, for you are glorious and mighty. You've brought us here. We pray that Pastor Mike would be okay and would not catch the COVID. We pray for a, that blessing to be upon us here. We pray that you guide us and direct us, soften our hearts to hear your word, to be, to actively proclaim it, to accept it. Guide and direct each one of us, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. So, some of you, most of you know me. My name's Jim. I've um, been a deacon here for a few years, off and on. Um, I actually started at the church in uh, 1996 because my dad said, um, I know of a church that's up the road from there because my grandmother wanted to go to a Catholic church and that it was okay, but it didn't seem to fit for me. So he pointed me over here. He said, I went to this place for vacation Bible school. Why don't you go and try it out? So I did. And because of a vacation Bible school done back in the 40s, 50s, I am here today. Um, you never know what you do today, how it can reach out for something in the future. So today's passage is mostly most of Acts chapter 2. So let us uh, begin with that. I'm going to start reading, and I probably will uh, speak, go off track a couple of times, but um, this is, uh, what do we call it? Uh, it's a special English Bible. It's uh, mostly... Um, more common words in the English language, so it's not as much Bibleese as some translations are. So, now, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came from the sky a sound like the rushing of a mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were staying, sitting. Tongues like fire appeared and were distributed to them, and one sat on each of them. And that, this Pentecost is 50 days, which is what Pentecost means, after Jesus ascended into heaven. Okay? He told them to wait until the Spirit had come upon them. So even though they hadn't really a clue of what he was doing, of what that was going to be like, um, they said they stayed in Jerusalem until this had happened. And so... They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other languages as the Spirit gave them ability to speak. Now, some say that this was, they spoke their regular language and everybody heard them in their own language, or it was they spoke a different language that the people could hear. Because as we see here, there are others that were, were hearing this. And so, now... There were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men uh, from, from every nation under the sky. And when the sound was heard, the multitude came together and were bewildered because everyone heard them speaking in his own language. You know, they didn't stay in the house. They had come out. They could, the Holy Spirit hit them, and they had to go out and start speak, proclaiming the gospel. So, and the next one. They were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, aren't all these who speak Galileans? I mean, these are uneducated people. How come they are speaking in other languages? How do we hear everyone in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and people from Mesopotamia, Judah, Cappadocia, Pontius, Asia, and the list goes on. So, from Rome... Proselytes, Cretans, Arabians, we hear them speaking in our languages the mighty works of God. And there's more than 12 nations listed here. There were only 12 disciples. 
But if you read back, you'll see there were 120 people gathered together in that room when this began. So, they could have, it is amazing what God does. They were all amazed and were perplexed, saying one to another, what does this mean? And that is one of the questions I have for today. What does this mean? For the unbeliever and the believer, what does this mean? Some were mocking, saying they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and spoke unto them, saying, You men of Judah and all you who dwell at Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to my words. For these aren't drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is only the third hour of the day, which would have been around 9 a.m. But this is what has been spoken through the prophet Joel. It will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Yes, and on my servants and on my handmaidens in those days, I will pour up my spirit and they will prophesy just as they were seeing right then. But there was more, more to come. I will show wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth beneath. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. It will be that whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is constantly repeated throughout the Gospels. I could say reiterated somehow. Okay, I did. Whoops, lost my place. All right. So, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by God to you by mighty works and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, even as you yourselves know him, being delivered up by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God. It was God's plan. You have taken by the hand of lawless men, crucified and killed, whom God raised up, having freed him from the agony of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. He could not stay dead. He said, you were the ones who killed him, even though it was not them, they themselves, but they had someone else do it for him, the Roman government. You cannot have a... You can, if you have someone else do something for you, you're still your responsibility. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh also will dwell in hope, because you will not leave my soul in Hades. Neither will you allow your Holy One see decay. You made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may tell you freely of the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And I have been there and seen that tomb. It is still there. But what does he say further? Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. Christ did not say dead. I've seen that tomb too. That one is empty as well. Actually, there were three of them, but all of them were empty. He foreseen this spoke about the resurrection of the Christ that neither was his soul left in Hades nor did his flesh see decay. This Jesus God raised up to which you are all witnesses 
being therefore exalted by the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this which you now see and hear, this very gospel. For David did not, didn't ascend into the heaven, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit by my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Jesus quoted that same scripture um, in the Gospels. Let all the house of Israel therefore know certainly that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Our sins were part of that, to crucify him. So, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, even as many as the Lord God will call to himself. I'm going to stop right there. You see... My notes are not coming up. Well, that ain't, well, it doesn't help. Well, I might just have to wing it. There we go. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, um, there's a one, uh, one question here. How does this apply for us today? There may be some who do not actually believe. They may just go through the motions. There are some who believe. But this is talking about preaching to the, some people and having the Holy Spirit I mean, we could say there's obvious implications for the unbeliever to believe. But what about for the believer, for those who call themselves Christians? I believe it is a call to obedience in making disciples. What was the one thing Jesus said to his disciples before he left? The Great Commission found in Matthew 28 18 through 20. And in there, he says to go out and make disciples of all peoples, all nations. It was not a suggestion. It was a command. So how many of us are doing that? I mean, the disciples themselves, including Peter, had a great teacher. Yet throughout the gospel, we see that the disciples were clueless as to what things were going on, what they meant. It wasn't until they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. When we believe we receive that gift of the Holy Spirit, so many of us become on fire for Jesus, want to tell others about the change that's come in our life. But... As time goes on, for most, it becomes the same thing. You get used to it. Some would say it's like a drug. You, you get used to, to it, and in order to get a better boost, you take more of it. Well, the Holy Spirit, you don't get more of it. 
He's given it all to you. So what can you do with that? How do you renew that? One is meeting with other believers. Talking to them about the gospel. Two, spending time in the word. Not just Sundays, but daily. It's so easy to set the Bible aside and let it go. I was a fortunate one and unfortunate. When my mom became a Christian, she sat me and my brothers down, five, six, seven-year-olds, sat us at the table and started reading a chapter of the Bible each night. It was fun trying to corral us into that table time. All of a sudden, that's when we had to get a drink, had to use the restroom. All, okay, all these things. But she was persistent and did that. So we were, went through that and going over that for what that 15 years of my life. Not quite that long. Uh, 18, until I was 11 years. I was seven at the time, and until I went off to college, we, that's when we stopped that. Um, but it was something that instilled in me the Word of God. I know the Word and how it is, and can point to most you bring up something, I can point to it in the Bible. But I know of someone else mentioned in the Daily Bread. This was uh, five or six years, no, about ten years ago now. Um, it mentioned a man who knew the Bible, Old and New Testament in the original languages, and he can quote any chapter and verse if you asked him no matter where it was. He was an atheist. So, what are you doing with what you know about the Word of God? I don't know, I mentioned the disciples, they were clueless until they hit the Holy, got the Holy Spirit. And that's what we have. It enables us to know these things, to bring them up when we need. Um, the scholars of the time were amazed at their teaching. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, they're going, come on. These are just Galileans. These were fishermen. These aren't educated speakers. But yet they're proclaiming the word of God in ways we cannot refute. I've seen at a Billy Graham concert, I saw a man who went to that a concert, crusade, uh, Billy Graham crusade. This guy, we got on the bus with them and went to the crusade and he went forward. The guy could barely put a sentence together. He was on drugs, but this group he was with brought him along. He went forward. And then a year later, I met him again on the bus. This guy was changed. It was amazing. You would never have known that he had been doing drugs and had been so out of it. His life had been changed because of the Holy Spirit, because of the Word of God. And he will do that for you if you let him. What did God call us to? Make disciples. How many of us are really making disciples? Um, we tell our kids about the stuff. We... Clock stopped. Uh, we tell our kids about things. We let them learn. Um, we maybe help the neighbors occasionally. But how many of us are actually making disciples? Does that always make mean that you're going out and proclaiming the gospel? But it does mean that you're teaching others to be Christians to be better Christians. It doesn't mean we're all Sunday school teachers. It doesn't mean we're all preachers. It means that you are actively helping others 
to be better Christians. And for those who don't believe, your life is such that they want to say, I want to be like that. Can you say that's how your life is? Do others want to see your life and say, I want to be that way too? They see Jesus in you so much. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God enable us to do things we do not believe we can do. We just have to surrender and say to him, yes, I will do it. The first time I was asked to teach Sunday school, I prayed and with fear, but God impressed on me that he would teach me as I taught. And so I did. I said yes. Then he asked me to present a message at mission. Bread of Life Mission in Seattle. We would go, our church would go there, church, different churches would do it um, each, each day of the week. Um, ours was uh, like the third, third Saturday of the month or something. So we would go there and um, present a message for them before they could have their meal. Then one day they asked me to do it. I was definitely fearful. I didn't think I was equipped for it. No, I had gotten up in front of people and froze. I was even, uh, they told me to, they elected me to be a representative, but I had to go up and give a speech and they were gonna, people were gonna vote on it. I got up there, I gave my name and forgot everything else and went and sat down. Okay, so I was not one to speak in front of people. Yet, God said to me, you need to do this. So, I said yes. And it went well. God enabled me to do the work. He equips us. We may not think we are equipped to do the job. We may not think we have that. But if he calls you to do something, do it. It is an amazing joy that you will find in doing that. So much. I never thought I would enjoy speaking in front of people. I never thought I'd enjoy teaching a Sunday school class. But I do. I enjoy those things. To proclaim the word of God. If you're willing to let the spirit work through you, there is so much joy in serving Jesus. So, I was not called then when I failed at speaking, but when Jesus called me, as I said, he equipped me. So choose this day how you will respond to the Holy Spirit. If you're an unbeliever, is he pricking your heart, saying, believe, I can help you, whatever situation you are in, I will get you through it. It may not erase it, but I can get you through it. Even for the believer. Will you obey his call to make disciples and see the wondrous joy he will give you? And it's just so amazing what God can do in your life. And as we close this section and get ready for communion, um, looks like the other mic is on now. All right. Excellent. If the deacons would come forward. If you would like to make a decision to follow Jesus, you can talk to one of us about it. We will help you and guide you in this. Um, at some point um, after communion, feel free to come and speak to one of us if you would like to know more about Jesus, more about discipleship and how you can become involved. 
we have many opportunities here at church.